Hi, welcome to Capital Update. I'm State Senator Dave Osmick. I am not Randy Gilbert. Randy is unavailable today. So I am stepping in for Randy uh, to speak with your two state, your two state representatives. Uh, with me today are State Representative Cindy Pugh and Representative right. Jerry Hurtas. Hi. And I am your congenial host today. So it's more about me asking you questions and maybe a couple comments from me. But uh, first off, I want to talk to you about uh, end of session. What did you think of end of session, your, your impressions? And we're going to be going into another legislative session in January. Cindy, what did you think about how we ended the session and, and maybe an optimistic future for what we can get done next year? Well, I will start with that. I am very optimistic. There is much work to be done, and especially based on how the session ended, um, our work is cut out for us in the upcoming um, legislative session. It was a short session, um, as you know, and very, uh, very intense. Um, it, it was disappointing, incredibly disappointing to me and my colleagues that the governor vetoed our two most significant bills. Um, however, there were highlights um, of the legislative session. One of the highlights uh, occurred in the very last hour, I believe the last day, and that was the signing of the uh, public pensions bill, uh, which was a bill that was three years in the making. And maybe we'll have an opportunity to talk about that. Um, so there were definitely highlights. Look forward to reviewing those and um, some significant disappointments as well. Jerry, what did you think of uh, session and how it ended? And it came to it came to an abrupt halt, and we were optimistic, but uh, we didn't necessarily walk away with a lot of what we were worked on for three or four months. Well, I think in the beginning, uh, when we uh, first came into session, uh, and I'm sure both sides of the aisle uh, certainly caucused what their priorities were going to be, and certainly on the heels of the uh, federal tax reform that was passed in December of 17, uh, we felt that tax conformity and uh, making sure that the changes in federal tax law would uh, be addressed. Normally in a non-budget year, we wouldn't be talking so much about tax bills other than maybe some tweaks in policy, things like that. But this was a major, major issue that we wanted to uh, get accomplished. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the governor has demonstrated during his eight years a reluctance to sign any tax bill. And uh, I would just remind folks that the only tax bills he signed was in 2014 after massive tax increases in 13. There was so much uh, pressure and public outrage over the uh, warehousing tax and a few other taxes that were hitting the rural area that the governor did sign a tax bill in 14. And then uh, last year we got a rather significant uh, tax bill, one that was the largest tax cut in more than 20 years. Uh, but that didn't happen really voluntarily either. That uh, only happened because of some of the provisions in the bill, which pretty much meant the governor had to sign the, the tax bill. And it was uh, strategic, but nonetheless it was successful. And uh, there was retribution after last year's session because of that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, my disappointment was uh, that Minnesota taxpayers are not going to experience a, a very comfortable uh, tax filing season next year uh, for the lack of signing a tax bill and all of the benefits that could have been passed on. Uh, there's literally uh, 5 million taxpayers, uh, well, we won't count the children, but certainly uh, plenty of filers in the state that uh, would have benefited, mm -hmm. uh, as were there other bills, such as the pension bill that benefited uh, about 560,000 uh, Minnesota taxpayers. Uh, on the tax bill, I mean, the, we, the final bill that we presented to the governor had rate reductions, actual rate reductions in the yes, lower two tiers. Um, so uh, it, there was also, the governor seemed to think that there was significant business uh, tax cuts. And when you really look at the entire package, the business tax cuts weren't terribly significant. But look what's happening at the federal level. We've, our, our economy has taken off. Why? Because uh, businesses are reinvesting due to the tax mm -hmm. changes. And now we're going to have, in January, we're going to have the Mark Dayton DFL tax increase. Um, how, what do you feel about that? Do you think we can get tax conformity done at the beginning of next year? And yes. We made that a top priority in the Senate. I don't know what's the House think about making that a priority for the start of the session. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's going to be uh, certainly required, and uh, hopefully, uh, regardless of 
of who controls the executive branch in the uh, next session. I hope that the executive would agree that there's a lot of issues that need to be resolved because you know, the biggest problem for most Minnesota filers is Minnesota's taxation of income begins where the federal government leaves off. And with the uh, significant tax reductions that were done at the federal level, that's going to mean a higher uh, net take-home pay or income as the state sees it. So you're going to have greater income that will be taxable as a result of not conforming uh, with the uh, federal changes. But I, I think you're right about uh, what needs to be done, and certainly uh, we would have the ability to pull out one of those dusty tax bills from the, this session and uh, make a few modifications to it, but I think we could move it rather quickly through both the House and the Senate and get it to the governor's desk. It certainly could be modified to be retroactive all the way to the first of the year. But there's going to be a lot of complexity in filing, and that's, that's going to be unfortunate for a lot of taxpayers if we don't get it done. I, Cindy, you I, talked about, oh, you I want was, to talk about I, tax I would. Um, I would just like to add that um, I um, completely agree that we can and will need to address this. Uh, the very first thing um, in the upcoming legislative session, uh, one way or the other, it's going to be very difficult now for the uh, ta all tax filers to, f to file. It will be costly and uh, will result in just a lot of uh, mayhem, um, as uh, you know, as as has been the case um, yesterday or recently, the Minnesota Center for Fiscal Excellence um, came out with their report and 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 detailed that as well. So anyway, we just have our work cut out for us, and and we'll be able to um, hopefully make things better for tax filers in Minnesota. I, I was amazed in the Senate that the tax bill became a, became a very partisan issue. We didn't have one Democrat vote, not one. It was the 34-33 vote. Uh, how was that in the, in the House? Did you guys have that level of partisanship on that bill? Because this benefited all taxpayers, whether, especially at the lower end of the scale, you actually saw rate reductions. Mm -hmm. We had, we had bipartisan well, support. Yeah, and, and I, th I think we did have bipartisan support, but it wasn't a, a lot of it because mm -hmm. um, it was uh, certainly uh, going to be one of those election issues uh, in, a, in a partisan vote. But there are a number of uh, conservative uh, Democrats that uh, are in the House, and they mostly reside in rural areas, and uh, they oftentimes do vote with the Republican caucus on these issues. But, you know, you mentioned something earlier, uh, David, about... Uh, the implications of, of the governor's claims about uh, that this tax bill was big breaks for business. No, it wasn't. In net, it was actually a modest tax increase. Uh, and the individual income tax rates was a bill that I had introduced in the tax committee. Uh, that was my authorship, and uh, it certainly was very scalable, and it ended up being scalable because of the uh, target and the number that was provided in the February forecast didn't provide as much money as we had all believed and hoped there was going to be with regard to delivering uh, greater mm -hmm. tax relief. But um, it was very scalable, and uh, Minnesota has a stacked income tax tier, so even a reduction at the lowest rate uh, benefited every taxpayer in Minnesota, and even a reduction at the second tier uh, benefited about three-fourths of, of taxpayers in, in Minnesota. So it was uh, a significant impact to, to all of the uh, taxpayers. If memory serves me correctly, <clears throat> we also had safe schools money in the tax bill. Um, I was shocked that, and there was also, uh, and, and this is something that's personal now for me because I have someone that's related to me that has this, there was some dyslexia um, uh, educational money that was inside of that tax bill. And again, that went up in smoke with, the, with, the, with Governor Dayton and his DFL cohorts. It went up in smoke. Yeah. It, it did. I, I would like to remind everyone um, that we passed two tax bills to the governor. He vetoed, vetoed the first one yeah. and called for, um, you know, called for monies for uh, safe schools. So what we did was we sent a second bill back with revisions, and Rep. Hurtas could speak to the specifics of that, but we included uh, significantly more money than the governor had requested for safe schools in the tax bill, which would have been completely related, and so that we did our work twice. 
We, yeah. did, we did our work twice as a legislature. It was very disappointing. So not only was that, a lot of provisions went down with the bill. Um, I had a provision in the tax bill, which I was so disappointed was not included. And it was specific to the Thaler um, Ice mm -hmm. um, Center, the sports center um, in Mound. And uh, it were all kinds of uh, individual provisions that went down. And so again, we're gonna pick those right back up. Well, one of the bills he actually signed was the pensions bill. Uh, so, Cindy, you want to talk about what, what you thought about the pensions bill? And I, if I remember correctly, it stabilized pensions in Minnesota and also might even save some money. It did. Uh, actually, the, it, it was three years in the, in the making. The governor vetoed the pensions bill the last two years. And so this was absolutely critical that we shore up and change the trajectory of the uh, sustainability of public pensions. Upon having signed the bill, um, the state of Minnesota um, reduces its unfunded liability by $3.4 billion. And this is an issue that I've been talking about since 2012. When I went door to door on that issue of the $17 billion unfunded public pension liability, you know, we need to honor our obligations that we've made to the 500,000 pensioners, uh, you know, public employees, I should say, but we need to change the trajectory going forward, and that's what this bill did. It will save millions, um, I believe the number is 57 million in 19, and over 100 million in the next biennium. So we're def we've definitely changed the trajectory, and we've shored things up for, for teachers, for uh, police and firefighters, and other public employees as well. So this was a very a very good thing. And when people talk about how there's partisanship down at the Capitol, there are times, and we just talked about the tax bill, but on the pensions bill, it was very much a bipartisan effort. Matter of fact, I don't, Unanimous. Think, there, yeah, I don't think there were any red votes on the board on our side. There were not. Yeah, and, and as was the case last year, um, all but mm -hmm. uh, just a handful, six or eight members out of 201 combining the House and the Senate had voted for the pension bill. Mm -hmm. So you have such a broadly bipartisan uh, mm -hmm. pension bill that was passed by 192, 90 plus members, 192 mm -hmm. or so, yes. and the governor vetoed that bill. Uh, I mean, when, when you are the executive and you have such broad bipartisan support, I mean, everybody was kind of scratching their heads mm -hmm. last year. So this year, um, the pension bill was signed and that uh, certainly made a, a great improvement for about 560 some thousand pensioners in Minnesota that rely on a state pension. And as Representative Pugh said, and I agree wholeheartedly that a promise made is a promise mm -hmm. that should be kept and so we needed to do something about this. But even on the signing of the bill, there was about $3.8 billion of unfunded liability that instantly disappeared because of tweaks and changes that mm -hmm. uh, uh, improve the health and the stability of the fund. But yep. that meant that we went from 70% of funded liability up to about 75%. And uh, although it's a good first step, we still got another 16 billion to go. And so uh, hopefully the economy continues to improve, uh, the investments in the market and the equities will continue to improve and that we can shore up the uh, pension uh, for the long term, but it's still going to need future work. I agree. We will be right back after this break and take up a couple of different mo different other issues, a bonding bill and maybe some health care discussion and talk about the Officer Matthews naming of Highway 12. So we'll be right back. Check out LMCC on Facebook. Be sure to like and friend us so you can keep up on all the happenings or to watch one of our latest videos. Hi, welcome back to Capital Update. I'm still not Randy Gilbert. Sitting in for Randy Gilbert today is <laughs> Senator Dave Osmick, that's me. And again, we're talking with Representative Cindy Pugh and Representative Jerry Hurtas. So when we left, uh, we were gonna talk about bonding. And one of the bills, again, one of the, it seems like one of the few bills he signed, that Governor Dayton signed was the bonding bill. Cindy, you wanna talk about what was in that bill? And it, was, it wasn't as large as some people wanted. The governor wanted double 
Matter of fact, he, he quipped about saying, well, where's the other half? He did. Uh, but why don't, you th why don't we talk about the bonding bill? Sure. Well, as I recall, the governor put out a, uh, his, his bonding pill, bill, his proposal, which was approaching a, a billion and a half dollars. Uh, what we uh, came up with in the House, and it was mirrored in the Senate in dollars, was $825 million. And that was planned for in the biennium budget, which would um, have, which was uh, signed into law last year. So this was the framework for what would be the bonding bill. I believe that it was signed also, or uh, sent to the governor the very, uh, very last day, one of the last days. It's a process that that culminates, and it was a very, very good bill. I heard from members, very senior members, that this was one of the most infrastructure-heavy bills, bonding bills, um, that in recent memory. Uh, it was very heavy on uh, roads and bridges, hundreds of millions of dollars. It was heavy on um, infrastructure, uh, improvements to state-owned property uh, buildings at the University of Minnesota, for example. It was a, a very good bill that uh, garnered my support. I was very pleased um, that I was able to secure the $9 million in funding for the com uh, completion of Highway 101 in Carver County, the southernmost part of our district. And uh, you know, this we've lived in Carver County for 30 years, and this treacherous, uh, very dangerous piece of road uh, needed to be completed so that people could use it all year round. You couldn't actually access um, that stretch um, in the dead of winter and icy conditions. So I was very pleased that that happened. Well, and I Carver thought County priority. And I thought that 825 was about right. It actually was mm -hmm. very close to what we were retiring in debt to begin with. Mm -hmm. So there was no net necessarily yes. net impact to the taxpayers, uh, and it didn't provide funding for mm. snow making machines. And at you know Aunt Sally's barbecue pit that somebody wanted to build, you know those type of silly things weren't included. But Jerry, one of the things right. that was included was something you and I worked on uh, in in the uh, northern half of the district. You want to talk about those projects we got in? Well, thank you, and uh, thank you for your help in the Senate on that. But uh, we did get funding uh, to improve uh, rail grade crossings: uh, one in Loretto, uh, one in Medina, one on Berry Avenue in uh, Wyzetta. Uh, we also uh, got some uh, funding to uh, complete uh, Loretto wastewater treatment uh, facility expansion and connections. Uh, those were uh, projects that mm -hmm. uh, certainly, again, examples of what Representative Pugh talked about. And public facility uh, aid in terms of infrastructure, it was, uh, as she mentioned, uh, very heavy on, on roads and bridges and those types of improvements and really uh, important uh, projects that are going to really uh, put uh, people back to work in the construction industries as well and be good paying jobs and and it's uh, sorely needed with regard to the congestion that we've experienced uh, around the metro region as well as uh, greater Minnesota. So these are, are great projects that, that are going to be done and I'm not embarrassed uh, in having signed a onto a bonding bill uh, because of, of this type of prioritization as you mentioned it was a, a bill that really address, addressed needs not wants. And uh, that really is uh, the critical thing for me that allowed me to support it. Yeah, it wasn't heavy with a lot. I mean, there's always, in every bonding bill, there's always projects that you would say, listen, this probably isn't a priority. But the vast, vast majority mm -hmm. is, sure. you, you have to go, when you vote for these things, you have to look on whole, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. One of the other subjects uh, that was included was uh, additional funding for the uh, Bridges account. Uh, and in Deep Haven, we've actually got a bridge that is very much in need of some assistance. I'm yes. hoping they can tap into that yes. uh, so that we don't have to specifically call it out, but I'm hoping that Deep Haven will be able to tap into that. So there's a lot of funding that made a lot of sense. I'm optimistic about that as well. And there's one other um, tremendous um, investment that was made in the bonding bill, and that is in three veterans' homes. In the House, we put forth a different source of funding uh, for these three veterans' homes in greater Minnesota, allowing veterans who have served their country to retire and live the remainder of their days nearby uh, their family and friends in their homes. And I just was 
so delighted that although the funding source, the extra resources from the um, from the uh, stadium uh, were not used, but they, these homes were put into the bonding bill, and this is. This is a real victory for all of our veterans. In fact, I was working with a what would have been a, ho a homeless veteran um, in in our district, and um, as as it were, he was in need of potentially needing to look at one of those homes and moving far, far away from home. Uh, affordable housing became available, but it really brought to life to me the need for serving our veterans um, in the communities in which they live. And I was just delighted that that was included in the bill. Well, I think it, that bill really came down to a, a phrase, and I'm not a big Rolling Stones fan, but you know, there's a phrase that they, the Rolling Stones has had, had in one of their songs. Sometimes you don't always get what you want, but sometimes you get what you need. Mm -hmm. And I think that bill actually felt yes. that. And I know there's some fiscally conservative individuals that are upset about the three of us uh, voting for a bonding bill. But this is wholly responsible, focused on infrastructure and on uh, stabilizing our, our needed resources and not putting in fluffy stuff and fuzzy but fuzzy budding kitten type of stuff into it. So, I agree. and it maintains the fiscal stability of our state. So, Jerry, um, in June or June here, we've we've started to see some fiscal numbers about how the fiscal state of Minnesota is looking for the future. Uh, you want to talk about that and see where we're going in the future? Well, thank you uh, for the question. And actually. Um, we touched a little bit on the tax bill uh, that was passed in December by at the federal level. And by and large, what uh, is estimated that the average working family will see nearly $2,000 of increased take-home pay as a result of the federal tax changes. Um, every year, uh, we put together a budget, and then what the uh, Minnesota Management and Budget Office does is issues reports to each of us as legislators uh, how we're performing with regard to revenues and the forecasted revenues and to match those two up if we're on track. Uh, what I've been doing is I've been actually tracking each of those monthly reports and building them into a spreadsheet. And interestingly, when the fiscal year began, which was July 1st of last year, um, we were actually running a deficit. Uh, and when we got to uh, the end of November, we were $32 million behind revenue that was forecast. We were actually running kind of in the red and, and, and in the hole. And then the uh, Trump tax cuts went into effect. And subsequently, since December through June 10th of this month, we are now $900 million over revenue uh, that was forecast. So the state of Minnesota is in good shape right now because we have $900 million of more revenue that's been collected and that will probably continue that trend because this is really a sign of how the economy is recovering and that infusion of, of $2,000 into every household means additional sales tax, it means additional income tax, and this is all uh, benefiting the state. It's also important to know that we've got $1.6 billion in our budget reserve account, we've got $300 million in our cash account, and when you add it all up, that's about $2.7, $2.8 billion of additional revenue that we have as a cushion uh, to safeguard against any uh, future uh, recessions. And so uh, Minnesotans were asked to step up to the plate in 2013 at the end of the Great Recession, and the Dayton administration raised taxes significantly. Um, Minnesotans have done their part. Now it's time for the state government to not grow itself even bigger because of these excess revenues, and it's time to return this money in the form yes. of uh, returning to tax rates in the pre-recession area. And I'm certainly going to be a leader uh, in the House on this issue with regard to taxes. We need to make Minnesota more competitive than it is. Mm -hmm. Over the last 12 months, Minnesota's only been experiencing 25% of the job creation that the rest of the states have been experiencing. We also have been uh, uh, improved greatly with regard to our unemployment rates, but we're still lagging behind our peer states around us. So there's still room to be done there, and we uh, simply are, are not uh, doing what we could be doing to ensure that Minnesota returns to the uh, vibrant economy that we had before. And that's one of the big fears I have is that suddenly the checkbook is going to be open and you know and I know what happens when we got a lot of money laying around is that everybody comes down asking for a piece of the pie 
And um, I, I, Cindy, I, I think now is the, going to be the time that we can do something for our business climate in Minnesota. Mosaic, a, for, for a, example. a huge company yes. that was paying huge taxes in Minnesota is moving out of state. Yes. And why? And we know one of the reasons. So what do you think about that? We, I think it's time to do something. I completely uh, agree and so greatly appreciate all of the work that uh, Representative Hurtas has done to lay this out. We are in a very strong fiscal uh, condition as a state, but we have extracted far too many tax dollars from, um, from Minnesotans. And it's time to, again, change the trajectory there as well. And I look forward to being a part of the, the team that works to do this. Um, you know, we have had many uh, constituents flee the state of Minnesota. You and I have both heard from constituents. In fact, the Center for the American Experiment has done great work about the out-migration of Minnesotans to states, you know, whether it's Florida or Arizona, even Wisconsin, to what Representative Hurtas just mentioned. You know, our unemployment rates are low, uh, lowest in uh, 18 years. But um, Wisconsin is still leading, leading the way. Yeah. So we, we have work to do just taking a look at the states surrounding us. And I look forward to changing that trajectory. And I, and I think there's plenty of room to uh, go further with individual income tax rate reductions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important to understand that our lowest tiered rate on our lowest uh, income earners in Minnesota is a rate which is higher than the maximum tax rate in 23 other states. So that's uh, rather shocking. Most people don't realize, uh, because we've been subjected to it for so long, uh, what our uh, rates of income tax are. But uh, there's no reason now to not return to where we were pre-recession. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, we, we have preset spending in what's called the tails of our budget. And I'm, I'm very curious to see what's going to happen. And I think there may be places where we can invest. Unfortunately, the word invest in St. Paul means spend. Um, there might be some places where we could spend money that makes sense, but I think people have to understand $900 million is not listening to, you're not hearing the dinner bell as everybody comes to the trough. I think we have to be vigilant to make sure that we're spending wisely. Agree. Yeah. Uh, we're going to wrap up with one uh, issue that Jerry, you worked on and I was a party to. Uh, uh, Officer Matthews uh, in Wyzetta uh, passed away because of an accident, or, uh, an accident uh, last mm -hmm. fall, and uh, we got that bill passed through. Um, we're going to be, we should be renaming that, I would assume, someplace near the end of the end of the summer. Um, do you want to talk about that for a couple of minutes? Yeah, and uh, as most everyone has uh, well learned by now, Officer Matthews was a member of the Wyzetta Police Department, mm -hmm. and he was. Uh, just doing his job on uh, Highway 12 in the in the middle of the day, removing some debris to make the roads safer for everybody that's going by, and unfortunately, an impaired uh, driver with a uh, revoked uh, license and who was also a distracted driver by uh, apparently looking at her phone, uh, mm -hmm. struck Officer Matthews, and he died a short time later. Um, so, as part of the uh, the uh, effort in terms of educating people about our Highway 12 and the funding that uh, both uh, you and I were able to secure to improve the safety along the Highway 12 corridor. Um, it was uh, devised that uh, they would, they meaning the Wayzata Police Department had requested support for renaming that section of Highway 12 within their community officer, Bill Matthews Memorial Highway. So. The uh, police officer's uh, fraternity is paying for all of the signs and paying for the installation. There's no cost to the taxpayer, but it requires legislative action to be able to do that. <clears throat> it was happy to carry the bill, and um, it uh, uh, got green votes entirely in the House and mm -hmm. the Senate, and the governor did sign the bill. So that probably will be erected uh, in, in the coming weeks. I just want to thank you both for your leadership on that, and um, that I'm a proud co-author on that bill. and. Look forward to, to being there when the, the highway is, is renamed. That does bring up the one of the things that I think we might be taking up next uh, next legislative session, at least it's, it's something I'm going to be working on, is uh, Representative Frankie on your side had a bill stiffening the penalties and making uh, distracted driving much more Absolutely. of a significant penalty. If you kill someone, mm. there's very slim and small amounts of 
jail time involved. I think if you are distracted, you need to be held accountable mm -hmm. for your actions. It's not about what you did, it's about the fact that you did it. Uh, and I think that needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. And I think there's uh, certainly more that can be done, and uh, certainly there are some issues that uh, were concerns with regard to uh, uh, privacy rights and different issues uh, legislatively, but I would expect that something will be done in that arena of uh, distracted driving and the cell phone usage. The industry is also catching up very rapidly in that most of the automobiles being manufactured today provide you know, already installed uh, hands-free uh, Bluetooth type connections. And it won't be long before uh, you won't see people really uh, with the phone to their ear unless they're a passenger. I so. But I would just point out that uh, in Ontario, if uh, you are uh, observed by law enforcement uh, on your phone, they treat that up there the same as drunk driving and they uh, impound your car and you're arrested, and it's a, it has a very, very severe penalty. So, Well, more work to do, and that's for next year. So uh, thanks a lot for joining us on Capital Update. I'm not Randy Gilbert. He'll be back here next time. Uh, <laughs> and I'm glad you were here to, to listen to us and certainly contact our offices if you have any questions about the things we've discussed. Thanks.